They hired me from a company that was booking 500 million in sales. And you took them up selling too. sneakers. Right. To a telecommunications company that had 10 billion dollars a year in sales. So it was yeah. a huge jump. Huge, massive jump for me. And you know, and I was just, you know, and, and frankly, I was scared. <laughs> to, put it, to put it frankly, yeah. yeah. Thank you for coming here. Yeah. Being a part of this podcast. I mean, having been with you at TAC for a couple of years, several years, we've known each other through the American Club. I want to start off by yeah. asking you, where were you born? I was born in New York City. Okay. Yeah. Where? Bronx. Right in the Bronx? Yeah. Okay. Did you grow up there as well? Yeah. I spent uh, most of my life uh, as a child in New York, although my uh, mother's Canadian. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, she, she uh, um, you know, came to New York from Canada. And so I was born in New York, but you know, I became, I was Canadian by birth and New York, American by birth. So I was born as a dual citizen. And then- uh, Wait, just because your mother's Canadian? Yes, yeah, yeah, I got it. What if your father was Canadian? Would it still apply? Still, still become a Canadian, okay. right? So I have two passports to this day. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then for a while we went back to Canada and then came to back again. To see your family? Right, uh, yeah, to, to my mother's family, family yeah. And, right. and, and then we came back again and then when I was 14, uh, my father decided to move to New Mexico. Alone? Al Al Albuquerque, New Mexico. Alone? No, the whole family. The whole family. Right. The whole family includes you and your mother and father. Right. So I finished right. middle school and then I started high school in, in New Mexico. What were you like in school? What did you like in elementary school? Do you remember? Uh, elementary school is kind of hard to remember, right? But I did, I was a, that was in New York, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I was just an average kid. Average kid. Yeah. Any sports you, you gravitated towards? You know, I played soccer. Um, pretty much, but I, I was New never York, in New York at that time. Soccer was a thing, was it? Yeah, it kind of came up over time. Uh, I know it did yeah, because yeah. it was. It's never been a big. Um, as, a, oh, as, a, as a as an elementary school kid, I played little league like everybody else. Okay, so you right. did that. Everybody did little league, right? But did you hate it? No, I loved it. You look okay. Yeah, I loved yeah, it. I was a catcher. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I loved it because as a catcher, you're in you know you're in every play, right? Right, right. That's what's awesome, right? <laughs> you know. I still remember the name of my team. And you get and you get to tell the picture what to do. I, I still remember the name of my team. What was it? What was Glenn it? Stevens Cleaners. Glenn's <laughs> So we know who we know who sponsored. That was the my team. little that was my little league team. And then <laughs> did I went you know, on, did you know Glenn Stevens? Did you know him? It was a cleaner. Cleaning shop. I you know, know but did a, you know? No, I had no idea who okay, they were. Okay. Yeah, I was a kid. All right. And then I went up all the way through um, and then you go you know, I went through all the way through Little League and I I love baseball. Um, and then uh, yeah, what's the next leg? I forget so baseball. So so, okay, but you did it all through all the way up to sixth grade. Yeah, all the way through almost to high school. Yeah. Almost to high school. Yeah, but then I went. You and know, you were all, uh, as a back catcher, as a catcher, yeah. And as then eventually, catcher. though, you know, you run out of little league, right? So the next step was Babe Ruth. I think they used to call it. I don't know okay, if it's still right. around. I think that's what it was called, okay. Babe Ruth League. All right. I, I think that's. I can't remember. And uh, and then you know the level of kids in that, which is way above my level. And you found that out real quick. And I I was I just couldn't keep up with them in baseball. Okay. They, these kids were were super good. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then uh, and then those guys, those kids, then went into like varsity baseball and things like that. And what did you go off into after that? I, I, I stopped playing baseball after that, and mm -hmm. then um, and then. So uh, that's in junior high, right after sixth. Yeah, grade, right up until about one, one. You know, when little league, I played through little league, mm -hmm. and then uh, when I did Babe Ruth for the first year, and then I just couldn't keep up with the other kids. I mean, they're just so good because okay. most kids, you know, finish little league and they're done. Right. I continued, and then I just you know there was a big cut in terms of uh, you know talent right, at right, that right, point, right. and I just were picking based on. Talent. I wasn't there. I mean, the other okay. kids were just so much better than me. Were, you, were your parents really supportive of your? Did they come to your games? Yeah, they stuff? didn't really care. Yeah. So you yeah. okay? Yeah. What, did you, were you academically inclined? Yeah, I was. Yeah. Would you like what subjects did you like? Um, well, I, I got I really got into science, um, so uh, especially from middle school. You had a I good think, teacher then. Yeah. Uh, I just I think it's one of these kind of things where when you get to middle school, you know, you kind of make a decision on which way you're going to go as a kid. So there's the kids smoking behind the gym, okay. right? And right, then there's right. the kids who are studying, okay. right? And then and I decided to be the kid who's studying, right. not the kid smoking behind the gym. Right, 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 you know? right, right, right. And I just made that decision as a kid. So when yeah. you're in middle school, then from there, where did you go to? I mean, did you play any sports at all during that time? Just soccer, yeah. I said I, when I got done with Little League, and I really didn't play any sports. And then when I started high school, I started playing soccer, mm -hmm. just because um, you know um, it was just I, I, I you know, football was too hard for me. 
Um, I didn't, didn't, I didn't, didn't enjoy, have the size? I, well, I didn't have the size. I, just, I really didn't enjoy it, to be honest with you. And I just found soccer to be a much more enjoyable sport. And mm -hmm. it was kind of up and coming and, you know, they were out looking for people to play. Mm -hmm. So I started playing soccer, but I, I just, it was just, you know, a hobby. And the running didn't bother you at all because you still are quite a runner. Yeah, running was cool. I, I enjoyed it, yeah. It was yeah. fun. It was fun. You know, soccer was yeah. fun. And then you used to work, you know, then, you know, in those days they were started to put uh, soccer on public television. Right, right, They used right. to have a program called... But no one got paid on the TV. Nobody, had, nobody it was paid. zero interest in soccer right. in America, but right. they had a public television program called Soccer What year are we talking about? Uh, 75, okay. 70, okay. 75, 76. Right, 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 right. They had a TV program called Soccer Made in Germany. <laughs> and I used to watch it okay. as a kid. You know, and so I was watching like you know, Munchen. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> All my friends were watching, you know, the, the Raiders. You know, but I was watching Munchen, right, right, you the, know, the German league, playing in the, you know, the Bundesliga. Right, 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 and right. I, you know, uh, so that's kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> no, you love science. So, what kind of science did you like? What kind of science? Um, well, you know, you have a kind of limited what you can do in, in those days. But um, uh, uh, I, I became interested in like nuclear stuff, um, especially when my family moved to New Mexico. Now, the, now, what grade was that when you moved to New Mexico? Uh, it was about high school, yeah. So you finished middle school, yeah, and then when you high went school, high school, yeah, you went right. to New Mexico. Right, right. And then, um, because New Mexico, you know, it's got all the nuclear stuff, right? Right. It, you know, the laboratories are there. Um, you know, Los Alamos is there. Sandia mm -hmm. Labs, mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, uh, and my, my high school happened to be where all the kids whose fathers and mothers were scientists <laughs> working okay. at... Working at Working at uh, Sandia Lab, right. So I, I, you know, whether, I'm not sure this is true or not, but the two best high schools in New Mexico were Los Alamos High and Sandia High, where I went, mm -hmm. because all the scientist kids were going to school there, and Los Alamos so, was always number one, because that's where the genius people were, right? And then my school had all the people who were working in Sandia, which is another huge lab right, right, at right. the time, and it was the Cold War, so things, you know, it was really, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. was really, um, uh, you know going strong and there were a lot of people. When you have a school like that, I remember yeah. talking to one friend that went to a really high level school academically and he said, to be cool in the school, you had to be a straight A student. Yeah, not student. my school. You had to be a student yeah. where you really did, you excelled in your academics. It wasn't the sports. Those guys weren't the cool guys. It was the academics that were. Not my your school. school. No, definitely school? not. Definitely not my school. In, in, what was it like in New Mexico? It was just a public school, a big public school. Mm -hmm. I, mean, it had like, I forget how many kids, maybe 3,000, a lot of kids. Right. And, um, you know, in those days, it was the 70s, so you had the different groups of people, right? So the jocks, right? The stomps, which what you don't have a lot of. Stomps were like the cowboys. The no, we didn't have, okay, you didn't have to be in New Mexico. You they were in cowboy okay. hats and all right, all right. pearl, pearl button gotcha, shirts gotcha, and gotcha. things like that. The, the, yeah, the string ties. Right, right. Yeah. and the hippies. Because okay. at that time, you know, it was still the, the Vietnam the, War. Yeah, they still, yeah, okay. The Vietnam War was over in, what, 74? So I was right at the end of that for high school, okay. right? And there was still a lot of that going on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, then there was like the, the, the eggheads. What about the women lib thing? Because that was a big thing. Nah, that really, Not there. that really didn't happen. Okay. And then the eggheads, which was, I was probably probably part of the egghead. The, the, we, we call yeah. them nerds, right? Nerd, yeah, no, okay. I guess you call it nerd. But there were no computers then, so. That's right, so they were eggheads. Yeah. Actually, there were computers, it just, it just started. It just started, it just started. And it just started, started right. yeah. And I, took right. a, I actually took a programming class in high school. Basic, right? basic programming, basic, okay. basic programming. Yeah, I, I was totally interested in, in going to university, um, and so I, I was. Did you have a particular university you were interested? In? Um, well, what I really wanted <clears throat> to do was um, so you know, I kind of wanted to escape from my my family and my home. So, uh, and my family didn't have any money, so I didn't have any money for college. There was no college fund or anything. I had to do it all on my own. What did your father do? What kind of work? My father was a day laborer. Okay. Yeah, he worked construction. Um, my mother was a waitress. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, that's but they it. just had you. You're the only child. I'm the only child. Yeah. Right. Right. Did they stay together the whole time? Yeah. How are they yeah. doing now? Uh, both deceased. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry so, that. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, the, the the story is my my, my mother was um, a pretty terrible alcoholic, and you know my earliest memories of her were you know drunk, and um, and my father was a pretty good guy, which is why we went to Canada for a while. So, um, you know, you have a little kid and you're an alcoholic. It's not so healthy. So. My mother decided to go back to her family, you know, to try to stabilize. That's was why she cru she wasn't cruel to you. Oh, no, not, not at she all. Didn't, she wasn't abusive at all. Not at all. Not just so. just didn't function. When right. I was older, maybe a little bit when she's drunk, but you know, not okay. not too bad. Um, and uh, and you know, things are a lot different now because now people recognize it's a disease. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. 
you know, in the 60s and the 70s. It was, it was like, stigma. it was yeah. shame, right? Part of the reason I was academic, because I, I, you know, I really has made up my mind that if I, if I don't do anything, I'm going to be stuck with this, and I want to get out of this situation, you know, as soon as I can. Uh, so what I did was um, I studied really hard in high school, um, and uh, I was able to graduate a year early. So I didn't go four years of high school. I did three. Um, uh, so I got all my credits. I got it early, and I called. So you're 17. I was 17. Yeah, I was just 17. Yeah, and then um, I graduated. And at that time, um, uh, so when I was 14, first starting out high school, you know, I had the whole plan. I had kind of was planning out what you needed to go to college, right? Because you needed to have, you know, so much math and so much, you know, physics, whatever, whatever science you had to have in math and foreign languages, right? Mm -hmm. Foreign languages. So. Um, I didn't have any foreign language talent. I mean, the part of Canada my family's from is completely English. There's, okay. no, there's no French there. Mm -hmm. Although a lot of my cousins now are all uh, fluent bilingual in French. Um, so there was not a bilingual part of Canada. Um, and so I had to pick a language to learn. And it just so happened that year, when I started high school, they had a program called Career Enrichment, where they were recruiting students to go into specialty foreign languages. And at the time it was uh, Mandarin. Navajo, um, I forget another one, Russian, and, and Japanese. So I applied and I got accepted in the Japanese program. Well, I knew I needed to have foreign language for college, right? So, um, and, and the high school only offered Spanish and German, so I wasn't really interested in either one of those. So um, I applied for that, I got, they took me, and so I would go to my own high school every day do all my high school regular stuff, you know, math, whatever, English. And then I think after lunch, 2 o'clock, they had a bus that took the kids who were going to career enrichment. They took them to the career enrichment center. Which was, was, how long was the ride? It wasn't that long. Yeah. It wasn't that long? It was pretty, pretty okay. yeah, Less than a half hour. Okay. And then you, you were there until 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock at night. And, uh, and every day you went there for 2 or 3 hours a day. It was long. And you really studied the whole time you were yeah, there? Yeah, I did. Okay. I did, uh, I did uh, all four years of Japanese in three years. And, and so you had a, it was a really good program. So, you know, you got a certain level of ability, mm -hmm. even though you've never been to Japan, right? Right, right. Um, uh, so, and then, uh, so when I, I, I that, helped, that also helped me give me a lot of credits to leave high school early. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> what I really decided I wanted to do in order to escape my family was, um, I figured the only way I could actually go to college was to get a scholarship because I didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, academic scholarships are super tough. My academics was good, but not that good. You know, I, I had, and I, but I had great test scores. I was like top two percent in America on my on my uh, SAT and my ACTs, which completely shocked me. Even I didn't think I was going to be that high. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think I was that smart a kid. But I, I prepared. I bought one of these massive thick books. And I prepared, mm -hmm. and every day I was reading these books and doing all the test programs and everything, and I came out super high. I mean, it totally shocked me, right? I, mean, I think it was a fluke to this day. Somehow the questions I guessed were all correct. Okay, <laughs> so that's what I think happened. That's how you feel. Yeah, yeah. and you um, out that day. I just got a great score, and uh, and my academics was not you know wasn't straight A's, but it was you know, three point seven eight. I don't know B's. something, you something got like B's, that. Okay. Beat A's. A lot of A's, some mm -hmm. B's, no mm -hmm. C's. Mm -hmm. Um, but I did pretty good in, co in high school. So I wasn't really there for an academic, but um, what, I, what I really started to shoot for was military. Military, oh, right? ROTC. ROTC or the Naval Academy or the Coast Guard Academy. That's what I wanted, right? Uh, so I started to really focus on that. You know, I started to work out a little bit to get myself more physically fit. So when I, um, I graduated 17 and then I, had, I needed money, so I joined the Coast Guard as an enlisted man. Mm -hmm. And I went to boot camp and got sent to New York City okay. where I was uh, based on Governor's Island, which is in the middle of New York Harbor, doing Coast Guard stuff, right? And all along the line, you know, so I was a 17-year-old kid in the Coast Guard. <laughs> kind of weird, right? Uh, but I totally enjoyed it because it was like 1977 in New You're York. independent. Yeah, plus it was 1977 in New York City. It was crazy, man. Tell me about yeah, it. It was crazy. It was kind of a nader in 77 for New York, but that was when the... Kind of the subculture for like uh, punk rock and and the club subculture started to come out. Mm -hmm. So I got to actually experience that a little bit as a seventeen-year-old. And you got involved. You really got involved. I, I well, was, you couldn't. You can only go so I, far. I, only, you're yeah, Coast Guard, I was right? in the Coast Guard. I couldn't do much, but I was able to go out and and, 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 and you know enjoy the clubs. 
things like that a little bit. Uh, you know, I turned 18 there as well. So uh, at those days, as the 18 was legal for for alcohol, alcohol right. right? So then right. you know more opened up to me. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. along the way, so in the meantime, while I'm in the guard, uh, I'm applying for the Naval Academy and Coast Guard Academy and uh, ROTC. Um, I, I happen to know a U.S. senator. Um, so I was pretty much lined up for an appointment from the U.S. Senator. How would that happen? Just out of curiosity, um, how would you get to Yeah, when I, when I, one of the things I did in high school was, um, I think from when I was 15 and, a, uh, 15 and 16 years old, I began to work as a volunteer for the political campaign of a U.S. Senator uh, in, in New Mexico, a guy named Harrison H. Schmidt, mm -hmm. who was on um, uh, the last Apollo mission. And he worked, um, I think he was the second to last person to walk on the moon. He was a civilian geologist, mm -hmm. um, and he decided to run for uh, he decided to run for senator against a corrupt a corrupt senator that was in the office. and And I, you know, thought, wow, this is a great guy. How do I get involved with this? So I went in the office and, and volunteered. And then they, um, I was just a gopher for the the campaign manager. So when Harrison H. Schmidt, you know, this guy was a, uh, he had a PhD in geology. He was an astronaut. He'd walked on the moon. I mean, you know, and here I am. That's right. There you go, right. Yeah, here I'm, I'm with the guy. That's right. right. And I'm right. a kid, right? So he became sort of a role model for me. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to be I just wanted to be Harrison H. Schmidt, you know. And he, I guess he's still, I mean, if he's watching or here listening to this, That's you right. know, you did a lot of good for me, Harrison. You know, thank you. Um, but... Um, wow. Did he have a family? I mean, did he, I mean kids? Or no, anything? he was not married at the time. He had a girlfriend. He had a girlfriend. Yeah, he had a girlfriend at the time, yeah. Yeah, he had a girlfriend. He was not married then. Uh, and then he got elected. He, we won. We won. Wow. We won. That was amazing, right? I mean, we won. He went to, he went to, uh, he went to the U.S. Senate. That was amazing. Okay, so you knew him in the Coast Guard, so you already knew him, so you're right into him. Right, so, you know, but um, then what happened was uh, I failed a physical because um, my eyes, uh, they had a very, at that time, the Naval Academy, the Naval Academy had a very, um, uh, it was a very tough standard for eyes, and I was nearsighted. Mm -hmm. So I failed that. Okay. And then, uh, but I passed the one for ROTC. And then ROTC gave me early selection because I had a good test score. And then, uh, so I, I took ROTC, uh, Navy ROTC. And then um, uh, I was interested in nuclear power at the time. Um, and, uh, and I had a full ride scholarship, full ride, oh, and man. a stipend, a cash stipend. Man, so that was like set, got me set up, man. That was it. I was like, oh my God, I'm safe, you know. But when, I'm curious a little bit about your family. Were you close with your dad at all? No, not really. And not your mom either. No. Did you communicate during this time? I'm sure you. Was, with who? With your mom and dad. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. It wasn't a bad relationship, but just. But just wasn't. I know. I didn't want to. I, I didn't want to. Fuzzy. Live, it wasn't huggy. You know, I was, I was, I was sort of. You know, by the time I got to be old enough to understand this, I kind of got angry at my dad for not doing something about... Gotcha. You weren't close with your uncle's nuns? Yeah, I mean, I was. Yeah, to this day, I still am. Okay. Yeah, I, I, so I, they kind of watched over right. you and t t took right. care of you. So, right. so my whole family is in Canada. I don't have any family in the USA. And I go back all the time to see my family in Canada. Why? Because your father's family is all deceased? Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So you're really close with them. So you have favorite aunts? Because she only had sisters, right? Yeah, still alive. Wow. Yeah, still healthy, doing great. Yeah. yeah, so I love going back to see them That's neat. in That's London, neat. Ontario, and uh, outside Toronto. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did uh, they have children by any chance? Oh, yeah, I have cousins all over the place. And you take with your close, pretty close. Yeah, well, people. now with things like Facebook. Oh, right? cool. Before Facebook, you never talked to your cousins, right? <laughs> right, you didn't even know what they were. But now I have yeah. like, you know, 30 cousins <laughs> on, you know, Facebook. And I have some cousins that are amazingly successful. I mean, one of my cousins was, I think, the chief scientist at NVIDIA, mm -hmm. one of the first employees at NVIDIA, you know, things like that. I have another cousin who's um, uh, an amazing doctor okay. in, uh, in Toronto, um, you know, people like that. Uh, another cousin who teaches French in Egypt. I mean, you know, just all kinds of stuff. I hope you send them this podcast. Maybe they'll listen. Yeah, but they're all, they're all, yeah. all amazing people. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, they're all amazing people. So, beautiful. Yeah. They, they sound, you made me sound like they're females. Are any of them males? Uh, no, male and female, yeah. Oh, male and female. Male and female, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Male and female, that's right, good. obviously. Okay. So you get, you get your full ride. Yeah. And a statement, right. so you can party. You can continue to get involved in the music you started to like. What did you do? Where did you go from there? So I, you know, I see so yeah, I mean, I started off in in, in college, and you know, I was pretty. I was interested in nuclear power, and then started studying physics and. Look, and is this military college or? What? 
No, I was in. I went to the University of New Mexico. Okay. And I, I picked that of all places because, uh, not because of my family, but because at the time, if you're interested in nuclear power and nuclear physics, that was one of the places to go. Right. So I so I'll go here. I mean, I just happened to have been in high school there, um, and uh, so I said, well, let me. And they had uh, Navy ROTC, and they recruited me heavily. They really wanted me to go to school there, and you know, so I was kind of softy. I decided to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's nice to go to a place where people want you. Yeah. yeah, nobody else wanted me. But if I went to back in time, I mean, I had I was early selection, so I pretty much could have picked any college Anything I wanted. Anything you wanted, right? Yeah, I could. I, I think back at it somewhere. Well, so, should I gone to a different school? You know, it's always twenty twenty. Yeah, right. What they say. But it turned out to be okay. Um, so how was it going through college? Going through I college did great. I, I went through. I got through my first year. I took all the you know core science and 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 I decided I I didn't like engineering as much as you thought I, you I did. didn't like it at all okay. I just it just uh, and then I took a I took I took a t- statistics class mm-hmm. and 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 there was a lot of business school students in there and and then so I decided well, let me try a business class I took a I took a class in finance and I loved it that clicked yeah so then I just said I'm done with this engineering <laughs> <laughs> I went to I went to I went to the school of business Is that right? so I, I studied uh, yeah from so my sophomore year I took all. I, I got a business degree instead of uh, engineering degree. So and how did you? So yeah. how did you apply that in the military? Because you're still in the service. You still have, you owe them time. Right. So <laughs> yeah. So I was. You know, I was a midshipman, and uh, I did my time. I did my cruises. Um, I did all my training. What and, was the rank? You came out as a lieutenant. Uh, <clears throat> and ensign. What is yeah. that equivalent to? It's like that? a second lieutenant. Second lieutenant. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. I got commissioned in '82. 1982, okay. and that takes you to captain, or would you call? No, it? no, I was commissioned as you know. So we, while oh, you're yeah, in oh, right, right, university, okay. you're you call a midshipman, right, 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 right. And then uh, then you get uh, and because I was uh, I was a scholarship student, I became a regular officer, not a reserve officer. And um, and uh, you know, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do in the military, and you know, kind of wanted to be because I had this guy, you know, who was my role model, the astronaut. So I mean, I want to be a pilot, right? But then my eyes. Um, you know, I just Could my eyes. That, I right. still I was nearsighted, so uh, I couldn't pass the physical for aviation. And so then, what am I going to do? So I thought about it, thought about it. And when I was on some of my training cruises, I met lots of different people. And one of the people I liked was the uh, they had what they call in the Navy the supply corps, sort of the quartermasters of the Navy. And I got right. to know them, and I really liked that. And then they started to try to recruit me. And so by the time I became a senior, you know, they were saying like, yeah, you got to come join us. And then I, so uh, I requested that and I got it. And then I became a Navy supply officer. Okay. And then I, I got stationed in uh, Yokosuka, Japan. So your Japanese came in handy. You right. Said, that, that started to fit in. Did you plan that or did you just no, look No, they kind of get... set you, you know, somebody, you know, as an ensign, you're nobody. And, uh, right, right. And but so, you had to look at your record and what you'd done throughout right. your practice so, and you saw. Right. So they have a bunch of open billets, right? And they probably saw on my record. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I was I, that, by that time I was pretty fluent in Japanese, mm-hmm. and uh, they saw that, and um, they said, "Well, we'll send him to Yokosuka." And there was a, um, a ship based in Yokosuka. I was on a, a ship. You were on a navy ship. A ship. But you were in the Coast Guard. No, by this time the Coast Guard had released me. So when I became a, when, so when I got the Navy scholarship, uh, the Navy then processed the release from the Coast Guard, okay. and then I transitioned to the Navy. Okay. So I went from Coast Guard to Navy. Right. Yeah, they just you know did an administrative right, transfer. Right. right. Uh, so then I went to a, a frigate based out of Yokosuka, and I was there for three years, three almost years. three years, almost three years. I, I did that. I got I got a transfer to Italy. After that, I went. I spent a year and a half in Italy, and then uh, then uh, I was going to leave. What the kind Navy. of ship? Same kind of ship? No, Maybe. no shit. This time I was at an air base. Okay. <clears throat> in Sicily, <laughs> I got sent to Sicily. So right. How many, of you, how many of you in the Navy were a part of that? Oh, it's, a, base, it's a pretty big air base. It's a Navy air base yes. in Sicily. Oh, it was a Navy air base? Yeah, called Sigonella. Okay. okay. And I, I was put in charge of the fuel facility there mm. for uh, aviation fuel and um, things like that. So. How did you like that? That was awesome. That was a fantastic experience. Was it? Yeah. yeah. What made it fantastic? Tell me the parts that you um, really remember. That well, the reason I, I got sent there, I, it was um, they'd had a pretty big scandal. It was run by a civilian. Um, the fuel facility was run by a civilian uh, employee 
um, I guess what they used to call GS employees. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They and, still are, yeah. Um, they were completely corrupted, and they started uh, stealing fuel and selling it into the civilian economy in, in Italy because um, aviation fuel and Navy aviation fuel can, can be used as diesel fuel. And uh, fuel in Italy is highly taxed, extremely expensive. So you could basically sell this and make a lot of money. So they'd been doing that for a few years and they eventually got caught and the whole scheme collapsed and um, everybody got arrested and you know it was just a massive, big, huge scandal. And I was the guy that got assigned to come in and clean Take it up. Over. Okay. Yeah, what year was this? 85, 85, yeah. So I got the guy, I was, by then I was a lieutenant in the Navy and mm -hmm. uh, they sent me some training. I went, all right. Uh, and then I went in to clean it up and got it all nice and done. That must have been, it must have been you must have been very popular when you came, <laughs> when you came in. They made you Yeah, really they popular. were waiting for me. I'm sure they were. Yeah, they were I'm waiting sure for, they were. They it, were was waiting a, it, was a, it was a mess. It had mess. to be a mess. It, it was a mess. And, oh. uh, and they, they were waiting for me. So that all worked out. Then I was going to leave the Navy after that. Um, and I applied for you know, grad school and I got accepted. And I, I was you know, pretty much ready to leave. And they called me up and said, oh, you know, you did such a great job at Sigonella. You know, what's your next step in the Navy? And I said, well, I'm going to resign. Uh, Why are you going to resign? Well, I said, well, you know, I really don't want to go back to sea. You know, because that's just not my thing. You know, and I think I can achieve things outside the Navy. And I just don't want to go back to sea. Um, and I was looking at probably, you know, three, four more time, you know, C assignments. Still you know? had, you're right. Um, so I just, you know, I kind of thought, well, if you're in the Navy and you don't want to be at sea, you know, why are you in the Navy, <laughs> right? Doesn't make sense, right? So they said, well, you know, you did, you did such a great job. We got two opportunities for you. Why don't you think about it? The first was assignment to the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok as assistant U.S. defense attache. But that required me to go to uh, defense uh, language school for like two years to learn Thai, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, and then three years in in the embassy in Bangkok. Okay. So I don't need five more years in the Navy. By that time, I'm a lifer. Or they said uh, we have a an assignment in Japan at the U.S. Forces headquarters, and since you speak Japanese, it's perfect for you. So I came back and I said, oh, I'll take that. It's a great, idea. Oh, great. What a great idea! And I thought, okay. So I forgot about grad school. I put that off, and I said, I'm going to go to this place, and because at that time Japan was booming. It right. was, it was definitely. Japan is number one, right? Before the bubble, yeah. It was booming, yes. right? I said, okay, I'm going to go back it was 86, here. 86, 87, something like that? Yeah, it was 86. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 86, it was 86, there. yeah. It was Around there. that, 86, 87, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to do my job there, but I'm going to set myself up to leave the Navy. <laughs> You're still and, getting out. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm going to use that, t it was like a two year assignment. I'm going to use that two year assignment to, uh, to set myself up for you know the next thing. So. I came back, uh, I came back to Japan, I worked for the commanding general, I was a Navy guy working for uh, the commanding general who was an Air Force guy and his staff and between me and him there was a Marine Corps colonel and all kinds of different people, it was mixed up. I wound up being assigned to the uh, work in the, uh, at that time, uh, the defense agency, Boecho mm -hmm. in Roppongi, when it was, right, was right, in Roppongi. Yeah, it used to be, yeah. it's, it's where, um, wait. Um, Midtown is right, right now. Right, that's, that's all Midtown. So I, I used probably. to work there. Uh, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. I that all the time. Right. What, I always wondered right. what it'd be like to go in there because you remember the entrance. You go straight down when you come in the right. entrance, right off the street, straight right. down. I used to say, I want to go in there someday. Next thing I know, <laughs> it's being all taken down. Yeah, right, but it's always kind of yeah. weird though because you had like that's right. the, the Ministry of Defense at that time. They call it the Defense Agency. And then right across the street was like the biggest party area in, in, in Japan. The fucking you know? rocking the house, yeah. that's right. So I, I got a chance, you know, I worked there with the Japanese, uh, the, the joint staff, and uh, uh, quite a bit. And, um, and I got to ride the helicopter back and forth to Yokota Air Base from Hardy Barracks Hardy Bridge, many right. times. The they're helicopter still is still flying. Still, they're still doing the I, same, same thing? I think it's the same. Same Huey. It's the same, same Huey. Huey. It's the same Huey. It's same Huey. <laughs> <laughs> come back every single time. So, and, and the rule was if you're a colonel and above, you can fly in the helicopter. You, you made it to Colonel. I was not a Colonel. I was, I was nobody. You I was, lieutenant, I was, right? I was a lieutenant. But right. um, I would just say, Colonel, you know, Colonel, someone's flying, and I would just hop in with them. So they would let me fly with them okay. as a passenger, you know, because right. I, right. I had to do something in the Equate Air Base, go back and forth. And it was, at those times, it, it was terrible. I mean, there were, the, the highways weren't as developed as they are now. Well, so right, it right. took forever to go from Yokota Air Base, Did which you, is where yeah. the headquarters was. Right, right. The headquarters was at Yokota. 
out at Fusa, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the it middle still of Tokyo. It still is, yeah, the yeah. middle of Tokyo, right? So it took forever. That's right. They go back and forth. So the helicopter took like, you know. Especially, it depends on the times, too. And still right. the same way. It's just 15 different. minutes on the helicopter. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> same way. Right. So I used to try to jump that. So I had many times going back and forth in the helicopter. And then after I was there for a few months, I put my resignation in. I did some other projects for the military uh, at that time. Then I got out, um, found a job. But where, the, where, where, was you, where were you discharged from? From Japan? Uh, or you just, did you go to Travis or some, some base in the U.S.? Uh, the, na the, Navy, uh, the Navy... In uh, San Diego? No, it was Navy. Um, they had a personal personnel center in Yokosuka. Oh, so you, you discharged here at Yokosuka? Right, so they just discharged me the closest place to where I was, and uh, I got my papers here. Were you married? No. Did you know your wife? No. Okay, so yeah. tell me now. Now, let's right. go a little bit further. Right. So I'm going to bring you up to where you are now. So, so then I got a job. Um, okay. I got a, I got a job, and, I, and um, I was, I, my roommate in Italy, um, we rented a villa. Before I came to Japan for the U.S. Forces headquarters, mm -hmm. my, prior, my prior assignment in Italy, you know, uh, I lived off base, and I had a roommate, and he was a, he was a pilot. He left the military, got a really great job. And then when I got out, he said, you should talk to this guy I know who's a headhunter. He specializes in Naval Academy. You're not Naval Academy, but maybe he'll talk to you. So, okay. So he introduced me, and the guy said, hey, you know, John, you, you got some special skills. Maybe I can do something for you. And he, he happened to find um, a really big American company that was looking for uh, people who could, could, could speak Japanese. And you started working for whom? Uh, Philip Morris. Philip Morris. Right. <laughs> Philip Morris Management Group. They hired me in New York, and I was uh, hired as a corporate auditor. Okay. An auditor, right? So I went from this like running the fuel farm, fuel facility and being all this military stuff and riding a helicopter to being an auditor. Okay. <laughs> so you did that for how long? Well, I, I think I was there for a year and a half, and they assigned me to jobs where you had to have some Japanese ability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I got sent out a couple of times to Japan. I did work here and. Uh, um, and one of, uh, one of them happened to be a, a, a joint venture with Ajinomoto mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that kind of blew up. Uh, they had a lot of problems uh, and uh, some uh, you know, internal kind of management problems. And so at the end of the job, they said, well, why don't you just stay? So I was doing an audit job, internal audit, right? Um, and at the end of the job, uh, the management said, you know, can, can you stay here and not go back to New York? And you said? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can stay. Okay. Yeah. How long did it Because the audit job was really tough because you were traveling like 80% of the time. Right. So I actually never lived in New York. I mean, I was just traveling, right? So um, So then I, I said, okay, I'll take the job. I took the job. It made me like a, a financial analyst. You know, it's a pretty low-level job within this organization and all kinds of people at top of me. I was nobody. And then I just worked my way up step by step by step over six years to eventually I became the finance director and the chief information officer at the end of six years. A Japanese company? A joint venture. Joint venture, okay. Yeah. How much was the percentage? 50-50. Uh, General Foods was the, and, and mm -hmm. uh, Ajinomoto. Okay. The you were trying to do that with Philips and didn't the, the name of the company was Ajinomoto General Foods. Okay. And at that time, Philip Morris was a massive conglomerate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They owned Kraft Foods and General Foods and Miller Beer. You know, not just uh, tobacco. That was one part of it. But mm. I worked mostly in the food businesses. So, mm. uh, and this was general, the old General Foods okay. business, right? So, so then I worked my way all the way up to the top. How long company. did it take you to do that? How long was Six it? years. Six years. Yeah. Was this strategic, or did you just some some of it was, some of it was? You know, you got to be in the right place at the right time. So then I was working there and um, got headhunted uh, to go work for Nike. Okay. So the sports company, sports. You know. Right, right. So I became uh, vice president and representative director, their CFO, and also in charge of IT at Nike. How long was that? How long did I work there? I don't know, five or six years, something like that. They'd already been here. They were already here. Yeah, they were here. They were here because I remember when they came in. They had tons of problems. Right. But they had this. What happened was, um, they they came in at first. They had tons of problems, and then they had the boom of all booms. Michael Jordan, right? Took him to a whole nother level. Tiger Woods. Took him to Michael a whole Jordan. Level. <laughs> oh my God. Air Max. 
Air Max, was it 98, Air Max 97? Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Of course I do. Their they, business, just, their they business blew, doubled overnight. They blew the roof off. Right. The, they sure did. They, their business doubled they overnight. Sure did. Double overnight. Yeah. They, they had With Tiger yeah. and Michael. Was, right. They were done. Right. Right. And Michael right. Jordan came. Yeah. You know, Tiger Woods was here. Right. I mean, right. I, right. I met all these guys. Yeah. You know. Did you? Yeah. Um, That's nice. Um, you know, all of, we had all the best athletes. And, they sure did. You know, but, but there was the Air Max boom. Was it what was the really thing? It was Air Max because right, right. somebody wore like I forget some Japanese celebrity wore an Air Max ninety seven or ninety eight okay, or whatever yeah, it was, yeah. and then all oh, it just took off. It's it crazy. Yeah, yeah, and the business doubled, uh, <laughs> and they just they couldn't keep up they with couldn't it. Do wrong. Yeah, that's they right. couldn't keep up with it, and then of course what happened? The boom ended, and it crashed, big time. Took a lot of stuff, and yeah. they had built out everything I know. I know, to yeah. service the level, uh, the boom level. And then it crashed down to nothing, and they had all this, you know, was people inventory, and everything, everything. Inventory, everything. Yes. All that had to be cleaned out, and then that's when I was hired. Okay. Oh, yeah. during that time. Yeah, right. That right. all new management came in, so I came in, and a new, new, a new CEO came in for Japan, mm-hmm. and everybody was new. Mm-hmm. And then we kind of rebuilt uh, Nike Japan, and then we doubled the revenues again in five years. From but the this, low period. But this yeah. time, you know, it wasn't Increment, a boom. It wasn't a boom. You know, we. Got more distribution and things like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I, I still remember we, we was really terrible. Um, you know, we thought we'd have to close the business at Nike for a while. And I remember I, I went out uh, with another guy to look um, what was going on in Harajuku. You know, ever heard of Udahara? Uda, yeah, Uda, Uda, Udahara, right? Yes, yes. At that time, it was really was Udahara, right? Okay. And this, these yeah. days, it's like you know. It's it's pretty 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 normal, but yeah. in those days, Urahara was yeah, like right. Ura, Urahara, right. right? It was kind of like the kids. Um, what do you want to call it? Uh, the influencers we'd call them today. The, all the influencers mm-hmm. were there in uh, Urahara, and there was a shop called Chapter. It was a sneaker sneaker shop. Mm-hmm. Now we call them sneakerheads, right? And they had Nike shoes lined up on the shelf, blah, 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 lined up everywhere, and there was a line of thirty kids lined up. To get one. To buy Nike shoes. And I said, oh, we're back. We're back. Find out what they're buying. <laughs> what are they lined up for? Right, right, right. And then, the, you know, and all of a sudden, and that was a spark. And then, That's you know, good. things came back and we were able to build it up into a really good sustainable business. And today, I think Nike is huge. So I got to meet Phil Knight. You know, Phil Knight had a real soft spot for Japan because yes. uh, when he established the company, you know, he was selling shoes out of the back of his car. Uh, and he started the, you know, he had the vision for Nike. His first, uh, the first money he got, investor money, was from Nishoi Wai, the Japanese uh, trading company. Right. And, um, you know, I think to this day, if you go to Nike headquarters, they have a huge banner that has the name of the Nishoi. people from Nishoi Wai. Oh, wow. And he still, you know, they still pay homage to Nishoi Wai, even though Nishoi Wai is gone, right? Wow. Um, they still pay homage to those people, and, and he really respects them, even to this day. You know what what Nisho Iwai did for Nike. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah it's beautiful. amazing. It's an amazing story. Mm. So leaving Nike, you went where? So then I, I got headhunted to. At the time, it was J Phone. I, I had one, yeah. Right, J Phone, right? Uh-huh. And Japan Telecom was the parent company. It wasn't Vodafone, but they were buying shares and they were, they were moving. You know, they were moving in Japan and they were. They had set up an office and they needed management, and uh, so um, I interviewed and. I got the job. They hired me from a company that was booking five hundred million in sales, and you took them up selling there. sneakers, right? To a telecommunications company that had ten billion dollars a wow. year in sales. So it was yeah. a huge jump, huge, massive jump for me. And you know, and I was just, you know, and, and frankly, I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> to, put it, to put it frankly, yeah, yeah. I was scared. You're coming from five hundred million to. And it, and Billions and into telecommunications, which I, I really didn't know much about. Okay, yeah. I had no technical knowledge in telecommunications, mm-hmm. and so uh, right. and, and by the way, Nike was a great experience, a fantastic, mm-hmm. fantastic. I, I loved it. People used to ask me, you know, if you work for Nike, do you got to run? <laughs> and I said, Yeah, you do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> so uh, uh, so I went there to Japan Telecom, and it was a very messy situation. There was still J Phone. They had, I think, at the time, there were eight different J phones, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. each in, the, in regional areas of Japan, because it was part of the JR okay. Rail. Right. It was owned by them, and I was sent in 
it was they had some you know joint venture kind of thing and it was all really difficult situation and the, the shareholders didn't get along and um, uh, and there's all these J phones all over the place and it was JR versus the British which is kind of a tough you know cultural gap you know mm-hmm. JR is one of the most traditional Japanese companies you can ever find and you know Vodafone that is an innovative you know uh, mobile phone growing like crazy at the time in the uh, when was that? Uh, 2000, 2001. And, uh, um, <clears throat> and then Vodafone started buying up the shares of uh, JR shares, uh, the, the mobile phone company, and they eventually took control. And then, uh, so took about, I got there six months later, they took control. They appointed me um, vice, uh, ex- executive vice president, CFO, in charge of purchasing and uh, finance, and I was made a representative director as well. And I was appointed CFO of Japan Telecom, which was the fixed commu- fixed line telecommunications. They used the old railroad um, railroad right away for the oh, wi- that wires. Right? Is that right? That was the original concept. Okay. Of it, right? And uh, and then we had to completely turn this company around. Completely turn it around. Just go crazy, because it was you know we had to mash it. To, we had to merge eight companies. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, just completely get control of it. And then they had a really old technology called PDC, which was a kind of a Japanese Galapagos-style uh, telecommunications protocol. Mm-hmm. And the world was on GSM, right? So the only country in the world that was on, you know, Japan was the only one that had this protocol and it couldn't, had no compatibility with anybody else in the world. And the rest of the world was on GSM. The next level of telecommunications was coming. It was called 3G, right? You probably remember that, right? And so we had to transition to 3G, and that's what we did. And that was mm. a huge challenge. It almost broke our company. Did it? Came close. Mm. Came close to breaking us. And we, we did it. We got there. Um, there was a huge struggle. Um, along the way, you know, Vodafone really completely mismanaged the company um, from London. Um, mm-hmm. Terrible mismanagement of the company, um, and uh, eventually, at the end, uh, after six years, I was there and I had CEO. A, a very, we had a very close relationship. Um, you know, a guy named Masa Son <laughs> came knocking. Son Son, okay. He came knocking and said, "I want to buy your company, and uh, you know, name your price." And he gave us an offer on Christmas, on Boxing Day. 2005 unboxing day which is the day after Christmas right uh, I was in Bali with my wife and the offer came through and I went right back to Tokyo uh, and myself and the CEO uh, a guy named Bill Morrow we spent the next uh, five months 24-7 working this deal and we sold it to Son San. We closed the transaction. We got his offer on the 26th of December, and we closed it on the 28th of April, 2006. Two. And he bought it for two trillion yen. Two trillion yen. Which at the time was the biggest M&A deal in the history of Japan. What was it worth in dollars then at that time? What's that, $20 billion? <laughs> Something like that, depending on the exchange rate. Right, right. right. Yeah. So um, that was the biggest deal ever in the history of Japan at that point in time. Yeah. Now I and think it's been part of that. it's been trumped many times since then. Oh no, yeah. but still, yeah. that was the biggest then. Wow, you must have been on a real super high. It was crazy. <laughs> what did you do then? So you, your wife, you told your wife, look, don't worry, baby, we'll go back. <laughs> I guarantee, if this goes through, we'll have the best vacation we've ever had. Right. That's what did you do? What that's basically you? what happened. So I, mean, I, I kind of misspoke. Yeah. At that time, my wife wasn't my wife. You know, we were yeah. we were together for Which many. Is your wife now? Yeah, we were together for many years. Right. And and we were going to get married. You know, in uh, Meiji Jingu and at the uh, Tokyo Union Church, and have a big you know reception finally for her family and everything, on the first of April. Okay. While this deal was going on. <laughs> <laughs> did you do that? Yeah. You well, did. It was close. It had to be. We were at the end there, and Son San started saying weird stuff, and, <laughs> and you said, oh. he wanted to go to. And then said, like, so then he told us, like, on the twenty eighth of March, he wants to go to Hawaii, and play golf with us, oh. right? And and my boss is like, you got to go. Yeah. Son San wants to go, 
the deal is here. It's a huge deal. We got to go. And I said, but, you know, Bill, I'm getting married in two days. <laughs> you know? And he goes, sorry, John, you got to go. Yeah. And, uh, and then so and son says, well, don't worry. We gotta, I got my private jet. You know, you can come in. We'll play. We'll play golf. And you go right back to Japan. And of course, I knew that wasn't going to happen. I just knew that was not going to happen, right? Uh, he, but uh, luckily, Son Son got distracted, and I don't want to play golf. Changed his mind. Changed his mind. So the whole thing, we didn't go to Hawaii, thankfully. But you hadn't canceled April 1st? No, we had not canceled. You hadn't canceled? No way. I was you kept gonna, it open anyway. I couldn't cancel it. No, but you wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't have been here. Right, right. But I, I was See. probably... You know, I was gonna. I was hopeful. You're hedging your best. You're just I was hedging. hopeful that I could right. find a way out of this. Um, so you got married April first, right? And all the SoftBank people came, and not Sonson didn't come, but uh, most of his man, a lot of his management team came, and uh, it was a really great. We had a really great party. How many people were there? Uh, hundreds. Oh, that's yeah, nice. hundreds. That's yeah. nice. Um, then. Uh, so how many years does that make now that you've been married? What year was that you got married? Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, be, so. Yeah. Uh, then. Sold that, and Son Son asked me to hang around with him for a while, um, and I, and then you know, basically everybody went to SoftBank, and there was a small core of people that stayed as uh, Vodafone, which I was one. Uh, um, uh, I looked after the the company for many years afterwards. Though what was left of the company was still the, the there was still a, a paper company left in Japan. I looked after that for ten years afterwards. Uh, but in the immediate aftermath of that, Son San asked me to help him with a few things, which I agreed. Um, so I helped him, and then I went away. And uh, I got a job offer at that point to work for uh, Nico Cordial Financial Group, which was a, an investment bank, um, the Japanese investment bank, as a uh, as their CFO. Right? Um, and I took that job. Uh, um, they were. In the process of being acquired by City, City Group, so City was part of this deal mm -hmm. with me, and they'd had a scandal, an accounting scandal, and mm. everybody got fired, and so they asked me to step in and try to help them out, fix it up, mm. which I did, and so that was 2007, and then the financial crisis hit, at the, the Lehman financial crisis. It was just amazing time, um, just rolling crisis after crisis. Luckily, Nico survived. Um, city almost didn't survive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was bailed out by the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Many things happened at, at Nico, and we and I, you know, we really worked hard to keep the company alive, and uh, we, we we were successful again. And um, then uh, City decided to merge Nico with its business in Japan, so Nico lost its independence. It became City City Nico or something. I forget mm -hmm. what they called it, and they don't they no longer needed a CFO, and so. They asked me to stay on as within the city business in Japan, uh, but my, you know, personal is like you know, I, I, I'm I'm the CFO, you know. Yeah, okay. I'm not the deputy CFO. I'm not something this. I'm not mm -hmm. something that. I'm the CFO. So uh, they said, well, we need your help with some things, a few things, and and I I say, okay, I agree to do this for another year, um, basically selling businesses. Um, selling investment companies that they had. Uh, so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And then I agreed that after, after one year I'm leaving. So I left after that and um, decided to chill for a while. And I'd done pretty good financially, so I was okay. I could take some time off. Um, so I spent time in Singapore. I, went to, I took my wife and I moved to Singapore. But you had kids along the way all this time, too. So your kids went to school because you have yeah. two boys, right? Right, that's right. And they were in school in uh, mm -hmm. YIS, right? Did um, this affect your family? Because you were under, see, you're a fixer. So you come in and doing all those companies. You, then you handle pressure very well, obviously, else you couldn't do this job. Because it would make most people just break immediately as soon as they re reach a point where, and you have to be at the edge of it. When it looks like it yeah. might make it, may not make it, and then you have to tell people they have to go. Oh, there are times, Lance, where I, it was 50-50, man. You felt that way. I had, I had so how did you handle those I had, times? Well, there are times when, especially with City, which had a very, uh, very, a very thin decision-making process, right? And, yeah. and, and, and there's also a, a culture where people didn't take responsibility for the decisions. They, you know, they want you to make the decision. I got you. And then if it was wrong, then you, the one then you got enough. zapped and then right, they, exactly. they stepped in. 
right? Mm. So um, that was the kind of culture at City. So there are many cases actually when the crisis came up where people just tried to go on the ground. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. That was the culture. Okay. And, but I was CFO, I couldn't go on the ground because no. everything was coming at me. Right. You know? um, and so you know, you're just making decision after decision after decision after decision. And, um, and some of it was you know, kind of reputational stuff. You had to, you know, you, you had to be honest and you know, mm-hmm. not, not compromise your values. That's right. Um, so it was you know, totally stressful. So after that, you know, taking some time off was good. Um, and you know, uh, the city survived with the government's help. Uh, but now it's uh, you know since then they completely left Japan right um, recently yeah they left they sold off the business mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the Nico business sold SNBC and they closed the bank the retail bank is gone after a hundred years you know so city's pretty much gone you know um, you know they had huge I mean they had 125 members in the Tokyo American Club at one time now I think they got one mm. right. But I, I, the managers I worked with there were, some of them were super, still I'm friends with some of them, really respectful of some of the, some people I worked with, my two superiors. Uh, Doug Peterson, who's now I think he's very successful with SN, I think he's the CEO of S&P, and um, uh, TJ Della Pietra, um, who was the chief legal counsel, was the guys I admire so much to this day. Because um, of the integrity? Or? They were great, and working with them right. was really good, and they were yeah. smart. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, I really uh, enjoyed that, working with them, and they were very helpful to me uh, at the time because I felt I was in this investment bank that had a lot of problems, and um, the investment bank CEO was not really doing anything, and, and it was all coming down on me, and I was able to resource help from TJ and Doug, who gave me a lot of support, and, uh, and we were able to clean up many, many problems. Uh, and and survive along the way yeah it was kind of crazy after all that did you is that when you really decided you're finished i decided i want to take some time off to kind of decompress because okay. right, right. the you know that was really highly stressful period mm-hmm. of time mm-hmm. you know um so i decided i just went to singapore for a while and uh and then took some time i took about a year off and then um uh started talking i started to get some calls to work in private equity mm-hmm. um and the portfolio companies. So, uh, and that was really appealing. And it was completely different. So I started doing that. I, I worked in uh, one company with Bain Capital. And I, I did a second portfolio company with um, Primera, which was kind of an odd thing. Um, How so? Well, I, I kind of always looked at myself um, as this like, you know, big corporate guy, right? The CFO of, you know, Vodafone, right? The CFO of Nico, you know, investment bank. So then, um, I was offered uh, to go on the board and to be an executive of uh, Sushi Row, Kaiten Conveyor Belt Sushi, right? Right, right, right. So at first, I'm thinking like, wow, it's a big step down, you know, and it's in Osaka, right? Okay. So I'm like, I'm this big corporate guy, this big office, you know. I even had a panic button in my office at City, you know, so. If some crazy guy came, I could push the panic button and then the guards came, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I never actually had to do that. So. Okay. Luckily, luckily. <laughs> but I had it. I had, the, I had a panic button. I believe you. Okay. And I was like, oh, the panic button. Should I push it? <laughs> you know, I used to, I used to joke with people about it. Me. Are yeah. you okay? Can I push <laughs> the button? I'm like, no, don't push the button. You know? <laughs> don't push the button. I, I want to push it. Push what happens? Whatever. I've never pushed it. <laughs> I've never pushed it. I want to push the panic button. Um, uh, it was a super interesting company. You know, the kai ten sushi, ka, right. kai ten sushi, right? right? And kai ten sushi, and, and at this point, time, you know, I was financially independent, so I had nothing to lose, and and super interesting company, and and uh, the the private equity firm, I knew them, and I had a lot of respect for them, and there's these are super super smart people, so I took the job, and uh, wow, was that fun? <laughs> that was so much fun. How long did it last? I was there for five years. What, what made it fun? Well, it was, it was a really old, it was, the company was started by a couple of sushi chefs from Abeno in Osaka, like a real old part of Osaka. And then there were two brothers and they grew, you know, they were pretty successful and they found a high quality, low price conveyor belt sushi uh, business model that was very successful. The brothers eventually had a argument and, uh, you know, 
and they split up and that caused a lot of problems with the company um, ownership problems and then you know just kind of like people problems and which uh, eventually resulted in private equity uh, buying buying the company the firm what I worked with was the second private equity owner um, and uh, what they wanted to do was unlike other private equity companies they they were completely focused on revenue grow this company make it successful that was their number one goal mm. you know not cost cutting not Very firing nice. people right not you know selling you know, parts of it all just just grow this company right. and the way to grow it was more shops and uh, and maintain the quality and make it the best quality you know um, and they you know hired some really great managers um, and uh, I came in as finance and I completely redid all the finances in this company um, got it set up so that we could grow as many you know our only limiting factor was finding sites for restaurants that was it we had you know we had the financing going great um, and we drew we grew that company from 200 restaurants to almost 500 in five years and uh, we I, along the way uh, we had a, we had some restaurants in Korea and uh, that had trouble so I volunteered to be the CEO of that I, I as an interim CEO I did that for two years uh, uh, based in, in Japan uh, I set up uh, I set up the company in Taiwan um, now I think they have like 20 restaurants in Taiwan oh they're still going they're, strong they're, oh yeah they, they're in Singapore now they're in Dubai in Hong Kong um, so uh, and then so we did that and then you know it's private equity owned uh, I made a co-investment with my own money and I also had you know uh, uh, equity incentive right mm -hmm. but you know the whole, the whole focus was on just growing this business and making it successful. And we were, we were beloved by Japanese people. Beloved. The high quality 100 yen sushi. And then, you know, I mean, we had the best. I mean, the maguro. You know, we had like a 180 yen maguro. Was as good as the, you know, high end sushi in Ginza. Right? Except you don't get the, the atmosphere. The atmosphere. You know, it's a conveyor yeah. belt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we developed... Uh, we developed all the computer system to do. Uh, uh, you can do a custom order using a, like an iPad kind of thing, and then we uh, 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 we developed a uh, app so you can do reservations. You can you can order ahead of time and order a seat ahead of time, and because um, we were so busy, the number one complaint we got from customers was that they had to wait too long to get in. Mm -hmm. So we, we introduced a, a reservation system. And uh, and now you can go there. I, I was there a couple months ago. What's the name of it? Uh, Sushi Row. Sushi Row. Okay. Right. The the entire your entire experience there. You never have to actually talk to an employee. You can check in automatically. You can sit down, order automatically, and you can pay automatically. Uh, it's pretty wild. But that's hundred yen sushi world. It's not top end right, right, right. Ginza sushi world, right? Because right. that's twenty thousand per person. Per meal in a sushi versus, row is versus 2, 000, a thousand yen right, per right, person per meal, right. Like that, right? But you come out full, right? And we actually would go there, and we'd say, okay, let's let's see if we can eat, you know, three thousand yen worth of food. We try that occasionally, you know. Let's see what we can do. Uh, we just couldn't eat it, you know. We we couldn't eat, it, you know. We couldn't spend three thousand yen, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, if you buy beer and stuff, you could do, but just food. Uh, it was it was so cheap and so good. It just, you just couldn't eat it. Yeah. Okay. You know? right. So you pile up the plates, right? Um, well, then in uh, 2017 we did an IPO, uh, and uh, uh, we listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, and we had a massively successful IPO. Massively yeah. successful IPO. Uh, we got a 1.2 billion dollar valuation, mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, super happy. Uh, the private equity firm that owned they sold I think at the time 70% of their shares they held 30 eventually they sold out their remaining 30 and the shares I think have since quadrupled in mm. value since then probably more I, have, I don't even watch it anymore to be honest with you because I, I I left the company in 2018 mm -hmm. uh, and then they, uh, so the shares along the way had quadrupled they doubled tripled quadrupled we were just it was amazing um, and I think now I look at them now. They're doing they're doing new concepts. The CEO is so amazing, um, and the people working there, the chefs and the food service people, are amazing people. Mm. Um, complete respect. And I got to I got to spend time in Osaka, which you know now I love Osaka. And 
It's great. I know the food's great. People, people don't know. The food people spend great. time in Tokyo. They don't know how great Osaka is. I know how great it is. My medical equipment business. I had to go there, and the first thing I liked was the candidness of the people. They don't mess around. They right. Money first. That's the first thing they want to know. Right. How much? Right. The next thing, the food is delicious. Right. It's completely most, different. Oh my! It's completely food culture there is like the heart and soul of Japan. Tell me, about yeah. it is. It is. There's no doubt. Well, that's all. The, well, the main companies are from there. Right. All the honsha are right there in Osaka. Right. But right. it keeps that roughness. It's just. Right. <laughs> it has that grit to it. It's not. They don't talk about the weather in Osaka. They don't know how much it's gonna. How much? <laughs> how much are we gonna make? Yeah. That's all they want to know, and I love it. Well, I at the time I, I maintained my home here. I, I own my own home here in Tokyo, and mm -hmm. I maintained that. And then I rented a small room in uh, Osaka. I was going back and forth, uh, you know, every week. Uh, I would go down usually on Monday morning early, mm -hmm. and then depending on the schedule, I would come back on Thursday, uh, sometimes Wednesday, sometimes Friday, and sometimes just spend the whole weekend there. Mm -hmm. My wife would come down, and we'd spend time in you know in Kansai together. Um, so she'd come down maybe for a week or two. And, uh, but it was kind of tough being away, you know, for every week for three or four days a week. I, that was the only thing I didn't like. Mm. Um, and that's, my wife would come down and we'd have fun and it was awesome, you know, and I was working pretty hard. So even if she was around, you know, you know so. John, look, only because of the sick of time. Yes. We're gonna have to, we're, you're going to have to promise me one more podcast. Not one more, but I want you to come back on. Sure. Because we're not finished. Right. I want to keep, I'm going to put this down here. Yeah. I want to take, I want to take us up to where we where you are now. There's so much more depth you have to what you're doing. But before we end this, what would you like to leave as some of your final words for this podcast to the audience? What would I like to leave with the audience? Yeah, uh, anything. Words yeah, I mean, the one thing I, I have to say, um, you know, you have a lot of challenges and some crazy things can happen in, your, in a business career, particularly in Asia. I always say, you know, number one thing that you have to maintain that you, should, you can never lose because you can never recover it is your reputation. So make sure you guard that. How do you do it? What are some of the things you do to guard your reputation? Well, you know, sometimes decisions come up, you know, and you have to make sure you make the right decision, you know. Between smoking in the back or? Something like deciding that. Deciding to study? That's right. Something, something <laughs> like that, yeah. Something like that. People ask you to do strange things, you say no. And, and it, you know, it could, it could cause you pain, right? You lose a promotion, right? You could lose a job, uh, but in the long run, it works out. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. John, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I really My pleasure. It. We will do this again. Okay, no problem. All of you watching this podcast, make sure that you press like, subscribe, and remember, it's all on loan, so keep reaching for the stars because you're too blessed to be stressed. 